Daniela, how are you? Glad everything seems to be going okay. I know we're going to let some people hop on here. Is everything going on for you? Yes, and we're going live today. Not Thursday, but today we're definitely going live. I hope that's okay. Is that okay with you? It's amazing what the, uh, the amount of time, the, what do they call it, the feedback time? So I ask you all a question, and it takes about 30 seconds or so to get it back over here. But now I'm excited about tonight. You all, golly, I don't know exactly who's who, but um, I'll tell you what. I mean, who's who in terms of these questions that you all ask, but these questions, my goodness, um, very difficult. I'll tell you what, though, it, it sets me up. Once the semester ends, I'm creating a podcast, and what I'm going to do is I'm going to read those chapters from Dear Mama, and when I read those chapters, what I'm going to do at the end of the chapters, and maybe even when I rewrite the book, God, hold on a second, let me take care of this, and even when I rewrite the book at the end of the semester, uh, one of the things I'm going to do, hey, Shwaneezy, what's up, Danielle? Um, what I'm going to do at the end of the semester is rewrite the book as a textbook for classes and put your questions at the end, right? Hey, Richard, what's happening? Does that look okay? I just feel like being myself today. So the hat's on backwards, glasses are glaring, um, everything else. Twelve people on here. Please don't tell me that this uh, YouTube is already going to start tripping on me. Uh, it drives me crazy. Um, hey, good evening. Good evening, Jessica. Hey, Kristen. Uh, before I start, I think what I want to do tonight, I have... Man, I'll tell you what, I have questions and questions and questions and questions that you all wrote. And my God, some of them are so, so difficult for me to answer. It's just, uh, it's just amazing. But what I think I want to do, and I, I've done this with three other classes. At the, hey, Jocelyn, Schwan, easy. Boom. Felic, what's going on? Boom. Um, people have really enjoyed these conversations. <laughs> Thanks, Jessica. I appreciate it. I'm just kind of kidding around. Can't quite get this part right, right? right over here over here but eh, whatever I'm too old to be worried about that stuff anyhow let's see there it is. All right. get that down like that this is what we used to wear in my neighborhood right we used to always have our bandanas on and everything else hey for lock let's not worry about that right now I'll announce in a second everything's gonna be coming back on Sunday y'all I please would appreciate if you all understood that um, I had to write a book last week and hey what's up Cassandra oh thank you um, let me just go ahead and jump into that clock. Um, last week, I ended up writing 120 pages on a book. <laughs> Thanks, Alba. And it's not something that's easy. So I did it in four days. I basically wrote 90 pages in four days because I had done 20 the week before. Um, and let me tell you something. It takes every, every piece of focus and energy. So even though I fell behind with your grades and stuff like that, shoot, don't worry about it. We only have three things or four things to grade at this point. I cut stuff back and everything should be going pretty well. If you if you focused on quality, that's the key. If you focus on quality along the way, uh, oh, Justin Fields is the man. You better believe that. Hey, Michelle, what's happening? Um, if you focus on quality and you watch that, if you watch you watch that um, video on how to write a great paper. If you watch that, listen to the lecture that was in the announcements uh, the same day, you're going to be fine. All right. Hey, Juliet, hey, what's happening? Um, but the book is fantastic. Um, as a matter of fact, I'm going to use it, and next year I've already talked to one of the department chairs. We're going to try to pursue a $1 million grant to start a charter school in Homestead for athletes who have a desire to go to college, uh, eighth grade athletes who have a desire to go to college and screen them into their freshman year at this uh, charter school and then provide them with uh, basically face-to-face -face education for the next four years because what we what we found was is that the labor market down in Homestead, especially Florida City, is very strained right now. Uh, unemployment rates are real high, poverty rates are real high, education system down there are relatively low. It doesn't mean anything about any individuals. It's just nationally, you know, the rankings aren't so high. So we took a look at you know, if education feeds into the labor market and you're not graduating people with proficiency, you know, the, the reading proficiency and the math proficiency down there, in, in, in Miami in general, uh, yeah, there is a QEP paper too. Sorry, Jocelyn, it is due. Make sure you look at 
the Blackboard assignments. QEP2 is one of the questions assignments that is due. QEP1 and 2 and there's another one. So yeah, that didn't change. Alright, that didn't change. You guys just make sure that you're looking at the, uh, because I made those modifications last week, the week before I mean, on what the assignments are and those haven't changed. Um, I might make a change. This uh, I've been having all kinds of uh, internet issues. I know, I see. Chris and I see that as having um, issues with freezing up. It's been driving me crazy because I bought an extender because the router is on the far end of the house. Yeah, I know, I know, I know it's freezing. Um, and it says so right here on mine. So let, let me just give it a couple seconds for it to not freeze, and then we're going to start up. Hey, Stephanie, how are you? Okay, here's how I want to do this tonight. I already received probably uh, even more. There's been more questions that came in. One, two, three, four, five, fifteen, sixty. I have 75 questions in front of me. But what I thought I would do tonight instead, and I did this this afternoon or this morning. I don't know what time it was. I think it was this morning. Um, what I decided to do is have you fire questions at me about Dear Mama. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to have you ask me the questions that are burning for you. Um, yes, yes, Richard, it's going to be our last live stream is next Tuesday. Um, and what I'm going to do is, is I'm going to talk about financial services. I'm, I'm thinking about it, Alba. I'll, I'll answer all those questions soon. Um, right now, my inclination is not to do the Zoom. Um, but let me let me talk about that. Let me talk about that with um, in the announcement board. Here's what I'm going to do, you guys. Between Thursday and Friday, I'm going to decide how I'm going to handle the Zoom and all that stuff. Let me get caught up with uh, losing basically a week to write a book, okay? And then let me consider what I want to do. I want to go through all your papers by Sunday, have a grade for you, um, and then once I have the grade for you. I'll make a decision. If, if everything is spectacular, I might make uh, some changes for the following week. I'll decide on the Zoom and all that kind of stuff. But for now, let's just focus in on uh, having this. Yeah, I know. The cable companies need to. They're, they're, they won't be here much longer anyhow. We're going to replace cable once 5G is here. And I think the cable companies are really, um, they're, they're pretty much a ripoff in my opinion. There's no reason for you to have to pay $180 a month so you can get cable and internet in, a, in an age where you know the digital economy is all around us. Uh, you have companies like Sierra Wireless where Internet of Things basically can present to you information real time just through the air and let, you, let, yet we're going to charge you these uh, astronomical fees and then the services average at best. You know what I mean? So you know, I don't want to get into it but uh, I shouldn't have to worry about an Internet connection or Wi-Fi connection uh, in this day and age when I have, not only do I have the router way across the other end of the house, but there's an extender right in the middle of the house that's supposed to shoot it a thousand uh, feet away. Yes? Look, Mark, Mark, okay, listen. That's all I've used are the announcements, okay? There's nothing else. You have to follow the announcements, and then there's a syllabus that was sent to you in the, um, that was sent to you as an email. So the syllabus and the announcements are all you need, right? It tells you everything that you need to do. When you submit, yeah, for real, Alba, when you submit your papers, I want them as an attachment either within Billboard or Blackboard or through sean.hopeworks at gmail.com. Right? So that's how you get it. There, there aren't any drop boxes. There's nothing like that because it wasn't set up. And we weren't, we as professors in our department, we were told we weren't even allowed to work during the May, month, month of May. Right, because we're not going to have a summer vacation because we're going to run right up into the fall semester. So we told we were not allowed to work. So there wasn't any uh, thing set up. So you have to go, go back and read all the announcements carefully. Go back and check your email for your syllabus and just uh, submit things as an attachment. It's really that easy. It's not complicated. And all the videos um, have the information that you need on top of it. So I, here's what I'd really like you all to do. All right? Let me just say, you all have been fantastic this semester. Um, some of you have been gone above and beyond, and I've recognized that. Uh, a few of you may or may not have turned anything in. Um, no, it's no problem. It's no problem. Mark, no problem at all. Um, but I have a whole batch of people who sent stuff to my Miami-Dade College email, which I said is absolutely forbidden because I don't check my email at MDC during the summer. 
and yet and still I had to check it for a different reason. And then I see all these assignments and it's like that that's not what I said um, and it's in the announcement. So just it's not complicated, just take a look at that. But what I'm really excited to see, um, oh yeah, the WhatsApp group, that's always a good thing. Um, am I in the WhatsApp group? Because I know I am for social environment. Am I for human behavior? Because I want in on that. I want to be a part of it. Because uh, I, I find myself, when I am on the WhatsApp, I answer questions right on the spot, and that will clarify things typically right there. So if you wouldn't mind putting me on, uh, my phone number is, uh, well, use the other phone number, my, my regular phone number, which uh, let, me, let me write it down for you because I want to be on this WhatsApp. Uh, hey, hey, Michelle. Um, is that Rodriguez? RDZ. Rodriguez? Um, anyhow, here's my phone number. I want to be on the WhatsApp chat. This is different than the one that I put down for your course. Uh, whoever's in, hey Daniela, who's ever in charge of the WhatsApp group, would you please uh, send everybody a link? We spam too much. I'm telling you what, man. The, spam, <laughs> the whole world is about spam nowadays. I'm a spam king. I'm telling you what. That's how I'm going to I'm going to retire. I'm going to spam everybody and, and do all that. Let's see here. All right. Thanks, Mark. There we go. Um, so if you wouldn't mind putting him, Mark, and myself on the uh, on the group chat. I like the group chats. I, I wasn't much for much of a fan for WhatsApp, but I find that uh, <laughs> here's what cracks me up. And then we're going to start, uh, hey, Danielle, we're going to start answering questions here in a second. But what cracks me up is I hated it, right? And then all of a sudden I find myself answering questions like this. But watching you all go back and forth, well, did he say this? Did he say that? No, and this is what he said. No, he didn't say that. This is what, I, I love watching you guys just confuse yourself. Um, and then what I find is, is that I come in with like a real simple answer and say, uh, no, none of you are correct. All right? Just two pages on Freedom Riders, choose a theory. Very simple, right? So in other words, I, and I don't sit there and watch and laugh, but sometimes like I'll get on, I got on one chat, uh, I was doing one of these live feeds <laughs> and the class kind of froze but I don't know so I'm not checking my app and I get on the app there's 76 messages I'm like 76 what is and I start reading it I'm like oh my god so everyone's totally confused and I'm like all right here let me just solve this erase everything that everyone said and boom here you go okay Alpha said message Kristen through blackboard all of your phone numbers all right so um We'll go ahead and go that way. All right, here's how I'd like to start. Man, we've already gone uh, 12 minutes. We haven't done anything yet, hey, Ariana, um, Aurelia. Uh, here's what I want to do. Some of you, let's, let's kick it off with you asking me questions about Dear Mama rather than me reading the ones that are right in front of me. Uh, the ones right in front of me are just, they're, they're fantastic. Some of you asked me about how hard was it to write the book. Uh, oh, thank you, Kristen. I appreciate it. Um, oh, by the way, when the semester ends, man, you guys, now, don't lose track of the old guy, all right? Uh, I've, I always enjoy the discussion. I hope you uh, maintain your relationships with one another because at the end of the day, 5, 10, 15 years from now, you are each other's resource. You know, and I still get opportunities uh, working with people from high school. As a matter of fact, uh, you know, the vice president of Twitter, he and I went to high school together, and then we had this guy who's a uh, global leader in cancer research and my friend who's a, uh, a commercial real estate agent in Denver. And the four of us got on the phone. We hadn't talked since 1985 as, as a group. And all of a sudden, everything was delightful. And uh, we gave each other some ideas of what to do for our businesses and stuff like that. So I had an impact, maybe, on what Twitter's going to do here in the future. So uh, that's kind of cool. But in any case, why don't you ask me some questions, and then we'll go ahead and start firing off from there because... I'll tell you, it makes it so much easier. And as you know, my, well, you don't know, is that if I was speaking live in class and you asked a question, it usually takes me an hour to an hour and a half to answer a question. Uh, <laughs> All right, Jocelyn, what other classes do I teach? That's what I'd like to hear. People want to take, uh, take some more classes with me. In the fall, I'll be teaching human behavior, social environment, criminology, corrections, uh, social problems, ethnicity. If you, uh, ethnicity and social problems are going to be held at, uh, on Inter-American or Padron campus or however you want to call it. Um, and then, uh, on, yeah, for next semester, no, not B term, uh, the fall semester. And then let's see, I can't remember, there's a couple other ones I'm teaching. I think uh, research methods, but I'm not sure. I'd have to look it up. Uh, if you send me an email, uh, Jocelyn, I'll go ahead and um, 
I will go ahead and check it out, all right, and, and then let you know a class that I'm teaching in the fall. Uh, we, you know, from what I heard, we're about to start back up. You know, um, in the fall, I heard, or in the spring, geez, in July, we're supposed to start back live, but with the surge in the number of cases in South Florida, particularly in Miami, my, my feeling is, is that we're not going to have live classes. I know they're going blended, which means um, you meet, like, for example, if you have a Monday, Wednesday class, we'll meet one Monday, and then we'll go online for Wednesday. Meet Tuesday, go online for Thursday. I know that's how I'm running my classes. Um, oh, come on, take corrections. Because uh, I used to work in a prison. You know, I worked in a juvenile maximum security institute, and it, was, uh, it wasn't exactly fun. Melanie, you have me for two in real life? Boom. Thank you. I appreciate it. Make sure... Make sure on the first day you come up and say hello. The one thing I used to do is I used to do this high five thing where on the first day we'd do a high five and a handshake that was special to the class, but I guess with the coronavirus I can't do it anymore. Um, however, I'll be so happy to meet some of you in real life that I won't even know what to do with myself. I'll feel like we're already family and uh, we'll be able to roll some things out that way. Um, but yay, nice, nice to have you, Melanie. I, I do look, uh, look forward to it and anybody else. Um, you know, we'll, we'll we'll do some special things, uh, and I always I don't I don't mm, I don't typically play by the same rules as other professors when uh, I'm in the classroom setting. So I think that you'd have a, a great time. Uh, let's see here. Okay, Kristen said, if you can please send me your phone number via Blackboard at Daniela Gonzalez. Uh, I don't know what that means, but there's your message. So okay. Who has questions for me pertaining to Dear Mama? Uh, I'd like to start answering those type of questions now. By the way, forgive me if I cry. I haven't cried yet, but uh, I nearly cried today. I was talking about something that uh, I wasn't expecting to talk about, and I found myself getting all teary-eyed. I'm like, oh, brother. Thank goodness these glasses are reflective of the light in the computer in front of me. Um, oh, we'll meet in person. We'll meet in person for sure. Uh, if you know what would be interesting, how many of you? Oh, I can't do that because I'm on a, a video recorder. Um, I, I, Alva, I plan on doing live classes in the fall. All right, I don't plan on doing any online. It all depends on what direction the university goes. Uh, all of us, all of us, all of us. Well, there's Lime Dateland. I'm there every day. Um, I know everybody that works there, I know the owner, I know the general managers, and so I go there basically daily, and I'd love to start meeting you all, trust me. I have a, I have my Ohio State cap on, you saw my team builder hat, the one with the funky emblem on the front that looked like a lion, that's my Primerica team builder hat, um, I wear that, uh, I wear Ohio State, so if you see me, come on down man, we'll, we'll uh, see each other at Lyme or wherever, um, I'm always hanging out. Um, Regarding Dear Mama, how long did it take you to decide to write this book and writing the book itself? That's a great question, Alvin, and that's, a, you know, about a third of you ask questions as to the process, right? Uh, it only took me, let's see, it took me literally two months to write the whole book. I could have written the whole book. Um, I was there today, too, Danielle. I was there today. Um, I could have written the whole book in a month. Took me about a month to edit it. I edited it eight times. It still needs another one or two edits. But I had to um, speak with Robin McGraw and you know Dr. Phil. His wife was here on campus, and I was her, I was her like lead up. Uh, Gina wants to be added. Gina Kerber wants to be added to the group chat. And so in preparation for that, I couldn't edit it again because I had to have it ready for um, sales. <laughs> I'll come to that in just a second, Jocelyn. So as far as writing it, if you read the foreword, you'll know that the reason the book was ever written was because I had had a unknown, uh, unbeknownst dinner with uh, Maya Angelou back in 1988, world-class author, poet, actress, dancer, teacher, professor, and I had been invited to have dinner with her during the student protests of 1988 at Denison University. And I didn't know who she was. I was sitting here writing a, a senior thesis, which ended up being 270 pages long. And it was, uh, hey, Roxanne, uh, that's okay. Don't worry. I always have connection issues, so don't worry if you had a connection issue. 
And so I didn't have time to focus on anything except my schoolwork and playing basketball and going to the frat houses. I wasn't reading a whole lot of extra. I tried to balance my social life with my schoolwork life. And I held four jobs, by the way. I worked four part-time jobs on campus while I was um, going to school full-time. So, you know, I never never had a free moment, never had a chance to sit down and watch TV on the, unless the Buckeyes were playing. And other than that, I was always constantly busy. So I didn't read a whole lot outside of sociology and anthropology. And during the, during the uh, protests and the sit-ins, I had actually had a chance to talk in my creative writing class about my experience with Mama Green and having grown up in an African-American family, living in, nah, I wouldn't say poverty, but relative poverty like we had talked about before, living in the inner city, uh, surrounded by violence and drugs, uh, all kinds of sexual depravity was, oh my God, it was part of everyday life. We didn't, we didn't know anything different than deviant sexuality. And it was just, it was crazy because it seemed so normal that you just said, oh, that's what happened? Okay, well, and there you go. Um, and I'm not describing the details, and that's why I'm talking like that. But, however, um, when I gave my speech, I, I talked in class about what had happened. And then uh, during these protests, we had had 1,500 people on our campus, and we had NBC and CBS and ABC and uh, what's the other one? They're all on campus, Time, Newsweek, U.S. News World Report. They're all converging on Denison's campus because Brown University in, in Providence, Rhode Island, had already had protests. And now with us being a top 50 school in the country, now we were having protests. And so I grabbed the microphone and I started telling the story and, and how I didn't see race and I didn't understand the concept of race. I could see color, but color never meant anything to me because the only thing that mattered to me was, as Mama Green said, if somebody loves you and they respect you, what's the, matter, what's the difference with the color of the skin is? And what's the difference of what they wear, what the, what they, if they wear glasses or if they don't wear glasses? Because I wanted to hate people, I don't know why. Everyone around me in school had prejudice, and I said, oh, I'm going to be like them. So I had to find something, and uh, I tried, and, you know, I tried to do the pancake tolerance thing where I played tough, duck, duck, goose in the kitchen during breakfast while Mama Green was cooking pancakes, and I tapped Daddy Green on the head, and I said, black. I looked at Mama Green, I said, pink. I touched Guy on the head, and I said, black. And I looked at myself, I said, white. I sat down and started eating my pancakes, and she said, what did you mean by that, and what did you say? And I said, oh, here, I'll do it again for you, Bert. And I got up, I said, black, pink, black, white, boom. And she said, well, what does that mean? I said, well, it doesn't, I don't know what it means. Uh, she said, let me ask you a question. I said, sure, Mom. She goes, um, does Daddy love you? I said, well, yeah. Does Guy love you? I said, yes. Do I love you? I said, yeah. Do you love us? I said, sure, I do. Of course. And she said, then, if you love us and we love you, what does the color of the skin matter? And I said, well, nothing. She says, you respect us? I said, yeah. She said, do we respect you? I said, yes. She said, if we respect you, then what does the color of skin matter? I said, it doesn't. She said, what does it matter if we wear glasses or not? If we love you and respect you? She, I said, it doesn't. And the more she spoke, the more I just kind of shrunk away and said, okay. All right, I get it, I get it. I know I'm five, but I get it. Okay, this is not the right thing to do. So for the rest of my life, I learned the most important lesson, which was never hate, never judge. And it's something that I've always lived by. I don't judge you or hate you because of sexual preference, practices, uh, ageism, no racism, no sexism, not homophobic, uh, I'm not sexist, and essentially it comes down to is that whole conversation when I was five years old, never hate, never judge, and never judge unless you've walked in someone else's shoes and you've never walked in anyone else's shoes except your own. And so those were some lessons that were extremely important to me back in that time. So. I'm talking about this on the microphone. I'm giving this big speech and I'm doing all this. And next thing you know, um, uh, I'm, I'm being interviewed. And uh, Dr. Stoneburner, who was a teacher in that English class, uh, and Lisa Coleman, who is one of my colleagues in social anthro, she went on to become the chief diversity officer at Harvard. And now she's chief diversity officer at New York University. And they, they both invited me separately and distinctly, but they both invited me to have dinner at Maya Angelou. Uh, she was coming. I didn't know who it was. And I said, well, where's dinner being held? I didn't say yes because if I had known who it was, I'd be like, yeah, yeah, I'd like to. But since I didn't know, I said, well, where was dinner? And they said, it's at the Buxton Inn. The Buxton Inn? I said, oh, my goodness, that's a five-star restaurant in Granville. I said, I'm going. And I had clothes. I was all dressed up and everything. And so I'm sitting here. My Angelo's to my right. Lisa's to my left. And Dr. Stoneburner's across the table. And there are two other students on the other side. 
And my answer was incredible. So she's sitting there talking, and I'm doing all like this. I'm listening intently. I'm looking at her. I'm watching. And I go, Lisa, who is this? She goes, that's my Angelo, fool. Just stay, listen to what she's saying. I said, okay, all right. And I'm listening. I'm listening. I'm like, man, she's incredible. Absolutely incredible. And Dr. Stoneburner goes, he goes, uh, Sean. And he was all eccentric. Yes, um, Sean. Would you mind telling Ms. Angelo a little bit about your story? <laughs> okay. All right. So I started talking about Mama Green and stuff. And that's how he talked. That's how he taught the class. Oh, my God. He would say, Marty, what do you think you want to say about Sean's work? <laughs> and, you know, you, do, you sit there for two hours listening to this guy, and he was brilliant. He was fascinating. So I tell her the story, and she leans back in the chair, and she does exactly like this. And she looks at me, and she goes, Sean, I think you need to write a book about Mrs. Green. I said, you think so? She goes, oh, yes. It's a story that must be told. I said, well, if you think so, then I will. Now, that was 1988. Okay, so in 2016, I was having... A very dark period in my life. I was really struggling with my worldview. I was struggling with where my place was in society. I didn't exactly, I, I felt like I had failed. Um, all these people had done all these things for me, and I haven't excelled to the point where I should have. And whether I did or I didn't, uh, I know I lived the American dream. My income is good and everything is really nice, but I didn't achieve what I thought I was going to achieve. And my family, well, I was heading for a divorce at the time. Money's going all over the place to take care of my children, which I always do. My kids always come first. Um, because I came first to Mom and Green, my kids always come first to me. There's no other way around that. So I'm sitting here walking down 77th Avenue by Don Pond. I've just gone up from 88th Street, and I'm about halfway up the street, and I just throw my hands up. I say, God, I can't do it anymore. I said, no matter how hard I work, I can't turn the, the direction of this ship. I said, I have to give you my problems and let you carry me. And I walked in the house, into the apartment, and I go in my room, and I sit down, and I'm just contemplating what I had just done. Uh, because I've been an atheist for years, because of Karl Marx and the opiate of the masses, you know, because he said that the reason why re religion exists is so that it produces a false consciousness, and so people will passively accept their social class position in life, so that even if they're being exploited by the wealthy, they'll ex accept that exploitation because it's God's will for them to be in that social position. So what they're doing is they give up, they give faith so that they can accept their, um, oh, awesome, Aurelia. So they give up their faith, they give faith so that they can um, maintain their social position and not feel like they're being exploited so they don't feel alienated. So I started thinking about my social class position and looking at all the people who, uh, in my neighborhood, used to used to um, who used to struggle financially, Curtis and, and all these people. Of course, you don't know any of them, but you know. And I watched them struggle. I watched my mother struggle, and I watched her deal with alienation herself, both in terms of the beatings that she received from my grandmother, and in terms of the exploitation of nurses back in the 1970s. Those of you who are nurses now can thank the nurses back in the 70s who were protesting and marching. My mother was a uh, she was the president of the Ohio Nurses Association and one of the highest ranking members in the country and led, led the uh, nurses rights movement back in the 70s and early 80s so that there was equal pay for you know equal work and stuff like that so they played an instrumental role but for me you know I'm sitting here and I'm taking a look around and the alienation was profound so I'm taking uh, I'm taking a look and I'm thinking to myself all right how does religion fit into this? Why would God let, God let this happen? So finally, 2016, I said, God, you take the wheel. And things started immediately changing. I'm sitting there in this chair, and I'm saying to myself, oh my God, it's time. It's time for me to write this book. And so I said, how am I going to write it? I knew the stories. Obviously, I know all the stories with great detail. If you've read the book, you notice that I remember things with great detail. And so, I said, I don't know, I'll think about it. And I had to go to this place, 
that was very exploitative financially. And I used to hate going there because I knew I was being exploited, but I had to do what I had to do. And so I'm walking back, and all I could keep thinking of was Mama Green's quotation. She always told me, baby, you have a million dollar personality. Never let anyone take that away. And I'm sitting here saying to myself, remember, you got this personality. Hold on to it. Just hold on to it. No matter how dark it gets, you have this personality. You have a gift. She used to say, you have a million dollar personality. That's what she used to say. So I said, wait a minute. She used to also tell me, never hate, never judge. Never let a man leave your home hungry. Never trust a snaggletooth bastard. And then, you know, you're so full of shit as a fat dog is fleas, right? And then she had all these different, which was one of my favorite, um, you give a dog's ass a toothache. I used to love all these things, right? She had hundreds of them. So I pull out a tape recorder, my phone, and I start taping all the quotations, right? And I get home and I type them all down. I said, there it is. There it is. These quotations are the things that saved me. So in the book, the title, Race, Grace, which is race, social consideration of race, Grace, which is my uh, reliving and coming back to God, because Mama Green was a very religious woman, and the wisdom to overcome, the quotations. And so what happened was, is once I had made that decision, once I had made that decision to write the book, it basically had taken 18 years for me to decide to write the book. And then when I did, boom, it just, it just came pouring out of me. Um, I wrote the whole thing in about two months, but maybe two and a half, and then it took me a little bit of time to edit the book. Uh, it took me about two months to edit, so a total of four months or so. Um, but let me tell you, it would have been quicker to write because I can just sit down and write, and I can, if, when we get off of here, if I felt like it, by midnight I could write, I don't know, 20 pages uh, off the top of my head on my next book called Ascend. I could do it. I'm not going to because I need to give myself a little break, but um, I could, and I, and I just draw an outline, and I just start pounding away, and it's always done, right, because I, I, my sentences are very tight, and so I could do it. Um, so it took me about a total of four months to write Dear Mama, but in between writing it, there were, there were some real issues that came up, and I didn't know that there were so many issues in my head that I hadn't dealt with, right? I hadn't thought about the, the time where, you know, I don't know if you want to call it rape, but I was definitely sexually assaulted um, when I was 12 years old. Well, if you want to talk about sexual assault, I was sexually assaulted, let's see, when I was eight, two, three times, uh, nine, I don't remember, ten. When I was 12, two different times. Um, so it just kept, just kept happening and happening. Hold on a second. There goes Mama Green's niece now, but I can't talk to her at this particular second. Um, and so when I took a look at all this, um, all the, oh God, I'm sorry. I got distracted by that phone call. Let me regroup for just a second. So, when I was going back through and reliving some of these things, uh, hold on, just, excuse me for just a second. Hey, Lisa. Hey, can I call you right back? I'm, I'm teaching a live class. Yeah, let me call you at 8. I'll be done about 8, 8.15. All right, bye. All right, sorry about that. So um, I forget where I was because if she, if you know, a family member calls you twice, you know, there's something that you have to deal with. And I know what's going on. There's some family situations that are uh, going. But what happened was I started to feel, um, I started to feel a whole lot of problems coming out. Right, a lot of stuff I hadn't dealt with, sexual assault I hadn't dealt with, and the one thing I had never dealt with, and I had never really thought about it was the fact that um, I had never dealt with Daddy Green's death. See, Daddy Green and I were exceptionally close. Uh, Mama Green and I were always very close, but Mama Green was very, she was funny, but she was very much staying in her own lane, right? She would hug me every day, she would kiss me every day, but Bertha was very straightforward. Um, she didn't play around, she didn't do anything like that. So, um, Daddy Green, he was very soft for a man. He, he really taught me that Men don't have to be all muscular. They don't have to be all 
tough. They don't have to be all strong and all these kind of things. They could be a whole lot more. Um, and in being a whole lot more, that means that there's a wide variety of how masculinity can play itself out. And as a matter of fact, as a father, I model myself as a father after Daddy Green, right? And so, um, and as a matter of fact, my children are treated like I was treated by Daddy Green. Um, they've never been spanked. They've never been yelled at. I've never had to raise my voice. And we you know I've treated them as little adults even before they could talk. And now they've blossomed and they're doing fantastic. And so based upon all those kind of things, it turns out that um, his methodology of raising me came out. So when I'm writing the book and he's in the hospital, he had just had a stroke. And after having a stroke, um, because we were so close, I'd say, hey, mom, when she go up to see him, I'd say, tell Daddy Green I said I hi hello and that I love him. Tell Daddy Green I said hello and that I love him. And every time she would come back out hours later, she would say, baby, I told him that you said hello and that you loved him. And he keeps trying to open his eyes. He wants to see you. He wants to see you. And I said, okay. All right. So I said, mom, talk to my mother. I said, mom, can I go up and see Daddy Green? And she said, no, baby, you can't go see him. Because he had the tubes and everything in his arms and I was just a little boy. And we were, we were begging the doctors and the nurses to allow me up. And finally, on a Friday, November 1st, November 1st is just one of those days I could just skip it. You know, if there's one day a year that you could just skip, that would be the day I would skip. Because um, that's the day my mother tried to kill me. It was the day after Halloween in uh, 1981. And then uh, uh, after she tried to kill me in 1981, then Daddy Green had died in uh, 1970. Four, 1974? Yeah, 1974 on November the 1st or the 2nd, or what I have, November 1st, and so November 2nd. So I was given permission to go up and see him, and I was so excited, and my mother was like, no, let me, I can't let you go up there unless you have a new coat. I'm like, a new coat? What are you talking about, a new coat? <laughs> what do I need a new coat to see him for? She said, no, I'm not going to go up there without a new coat. So this is a Friday. Uh, no, Friday, November 1st. And I said, okay. She said, you can go up there Monday. I said, okay, I'll go up there Monday. That's fine. I said, let's go get this coat. And it was a brown coat. I got it on Saturday or Sunday. And that Saturday, my, uh, one of my best friends named Bill Stewart, he came over. He was one of the first people to come to my house and hang out. Because, you know, I was an inner city kid living on the east side. And, you know, um, I go to this private school. So, as it turned out that, um, as it turned out, uh, lot, not a lot of people from over there came to my place. As a matter of fact, I did have one friend since we graduated. He said, man, we used to love to come to your place because uh, we could feel all urban. I'm like, you know, what does that mean, you feel all urban? I said, okay, all right, that's cool. Well, whatever it takes. So, um, so that was the climate. And I get a call from Mama Green, and Mama Green goes, um, hey, baby. I said, yeah, Ma. He goes, uh, she goes, uh, Daddy just died, and I wanted you to be the first to know, and I just put my head on the back of a chair and she said, you're going to have to take care of the house now. You're going to have to be the man of the house. And I said, okay, Ma, I'll take care of you. And she's bawling and everything. And I just put my head down. My buddy Billy, he's patting me on the back. And, um, it, you know, so he's patting me on the back. And my mom comes in and she hugs me. She said, my mom had a soft heart. Um, she was very hard at times. Uh, she, was, she wasn't hard. She was explosive. When her PTSD would kick in and mix it with alcohol, boom, that's when the explosions happen. And that's why I know so much about the PTSD, because she definitely had it. But in any case, um, so I wouldn't cry, and I didn't cry. As a matter of fact, crying had beaten, been beaten out of me when I was five years old, when a friend of mine, he wasn't a friend, he was a bully down the street, hit me in the nose with a ceiling tile, and I fell in a mud puddle off my tricycle. And I'm laying there in the mud, I get up, and I run in the house, Mom, Mom, and I bang, and I'm knocking over stuff, and what's wrong, Sean? I said, I'm crying. What happened to you? I said, the boy down the street hit me in the nose with a ceiling tile, and he knocked me into a mud puddle. Well, did you kick his ass? I said, no, that's why I came to get you, so you would kick his ass. And she said, get out there and kick his ass. I said, I'm not going to, no, I'm not going to fight with him. She, she said, give me your belt, boy. <laughs> I said, what? She said, give me your belt. I'm going to make sure you learn this lesson. So she started spanking me. She said, look, let me tell you something. If you can't stand up for yourself, who in the world is going to stand up for you? And I said, what? She said, if you can't stand up for yourself, who else should stand up for you? 
Well, the next day, me and Jerry Berry, uh, we went ahead and we surrounded this kid, and I beat him up. Uh, he came running in front. I started pounding on him, did the helicopter with him, threw him down in the cellar, stopped him a little bit, hit him a few more times, threw him around, body slammed him on the patio. He went running home. The next day, we were best friends, inseparable for life, right? Because what had happened was I won his respect by having been in a fight with him. Now, Jerry Berry was an interesting guy because Jerry Berry and I, uh, I won't tell you some of the stories, but one of the stories, my favorite stories, was there was a movie back in 1970, maybe 1971 or something like that, and this older lady gets pushed down the stairs in the movie, and then she hits the bottom and she dies, right? And I'm watching this movie, and I'm upstairs at Jerry's house, which was haunted, by the way, but we won't get into talking about ghosts and stuff. But um, I'm looking, and I said, Jerry, man, I said, you know, we need to practice that. He said, practice what? I said, rolling down the stairs. I said, you never know when someone's going to push you down the stairs. you got to, you know, you got to, like, brace yourself. we got to know how to roll. we got to know how to duck and roll. So we start practicing rolling down the stairs, and his mom comes in through the, the bottom stairs because he used to come in the door and then have to circle up to go the stairs. And she goes, what are you guys doing? I said, Joe, her name is Joe. I said, Joe, we got to practice rolling down the stairs in case somebody ever pushes us down the stairs. And sure enough, on my 23rd birthday while I was at Ohio State, um, this guy named Vince, he, uh, we were play fighting at the top of a flight of stairs, and he had played football in Toronto and stuff like that, real tough guy. I said, man, we can't be playing like this on top of these stairs. I said, someone might fall down. He said, yeah, like you. Boom. And he pushes me in the back, and I got a Bud Light in my right hand. Next thing you know, I just go into the tuck position, and I'm rolling down the stairs. I'm rolling down the stairs. And just as I'm coming up to the window, so I was like, oh, shit, I can't fly out the window because there's another story to go down. So I hit the window sill with my hand. I bounced off a plant. I went down another flight of stairs, and I landed in the living room. And not a drop of beer was spilled. But I had this cut over my right eye. And this dude named Romero, he actually is a professor at FIU. He's at Northeastern now. And Romero, he smacks me across the face. He says, what, are you some tough guy? And he walks away. I'm like, what? What are you talking about? So I go in and I finish my beer. So I go into the tough position while I'm going down. And I'm just thinking about how, phenomenologically, how we are the outcome of all events that shape us. And our brain can go back into our memory based upon our self-identity and our, um, the way we conceive of ourselves, And so while we're going, while I'm rolling down the stairs with Jerry Berry, all these things are going on. So, But, you know, people wouldn't come to the neighborhood. And Billy was very supportive. And after my mom spanked me um, for, beating, for getting hit in the nose and not fighting for myself, after she spanked me, I refused to cry anymore. And I became very stoic. And uh, I want to be a tough guy, and I want to be tough like Mama Green. And it got me not in trouble, but, you know, it was, it, was a, it was a language, right? It was a language that you learn because it's cultural capital. Once you learn the values and the language of your existence, right, that's what integrates you into the cultural system. Your social linkages to other people is what links you into society. So your linkages link you to society. Your language links you into the culture. And combined, it will have an impact on how you uh, experience intergenerational mobility, if you experience mobility at all. And so, um, what happens is, jeez, uh, I'm sorry, that phone call has me very distracted at this time. Um, so, what happened was, I stopped crying. And then, when Daddy Green died, I didn't cry. As a matter of fact, there's two things that happen in our lives. There's a turning point which is when something bad or good happens to us and it changes the direction of our life. And then there's a, a, a change, a turning point and a crossroad. And a crossroad is when we make a decision, right? We make a decision that we want to go into um, in, a positive, in a direction. So we make a decision that we're going to get married and that changes the trajectory of your life. Or we make a decision that we're going to take a job, for example. In 1987, I worked with the Philadelphia 76ers. Dr. J, Julius Irving, it was his retirement season, which was an incredible experience in and of itself. Charles Barkley was in his second year. Moses Malone had just been traded. You know, it was Matty Gukas was the coach. John Nash was the general manager. You know, it was owned by the Cats. As the Harold Cats owned it. David Cats was his son. And they saw that with my intelligence that I had the potential to be a general manager type. So they wanted me to come back in public relations at an entry level. 
and in that same semester, this is how I ended up, you know, becoming a professor. Uh, in that same exact semester, um, we had, well, the, 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 the spring semester of my senior year, we had a guest speaker come in from Ohio State who had graduated from Denison, and she was talking about the virtues of being a teaching assistant. Because when I was at Denison, I, t I had four part-time jobs at any given time, right? And I only made about $135 a month off of four jobs, but I used it to pay my tuition, and I had other ways of making side money. I was always in the middle of a side hustle. I typed people's papers. I did all kinds of stuff. So I always had money coming through me, but I'd always went back into school. So my senior year, I was uh, given a position as a fellow. And a fellow is like, it's like a scholarship thing where you have to work, you either do research or you teach or you find some kind of special project to do for the department and they pay you some money for the school year. So I was doing five things at that point in time, writing my senior thesis and Bachman Tavakolian had asked me to be his teaching assistant and one day he said, <laughs> when I'd been drinking the night before and uh, you know we come in, it was a Thursday morning and we used to meet at 8 o'clock, I've been up to like 4 in the morning, hadn't done the readings. He goes, Sean, I think it's time for you to go ahead and do a lecture. I said, when, Tuesday? He said, no, today. I said, today? Class starts at 10. He said, yeah, that's fine. You'll be fine. I, I said, that's only two hours. He said, yeah, that's plenty of time. And I'm like, the one time I haven't done my homework, I'm not prepared because we usually did group work on Thursday. So I said, okay. And I ad-libbed the class. And it went for about an hour. And at the end of class, he goes, Sean, that was, that was magnificent. And everyone loved it. It had humor, it had stories, integrated the concepts from the book. He said that was fantastic. So that spring, he goes, Sean, I think, I think you should apply to Ohio State. I said, ah. He said, what do you mean, ah? I said, I said I'm not smart enough to teach at a college level, Bahram. I said, and plus, everyone's going to be my age. I'm 21 years old. How can I teach someone who's 20, 21, 22 years old if I'm the same age as them? He goes, Sean, Sean. He goes, I've been teaching for 25 years, and you're the best teaching assistant I've ever had. And he said, here's the reason why. I said, why? He said, because you're more comfortable with yourself than anyone I've ever met. And you share it with these students. These students can use those stories, and they can put themselves in the picture. In the meantime, they can learn the concepts along the way. I said, ah. I said, if you think I should apply, I'll apply. Because it's two years already past the deadline. I said, I'm not getting in anyhow. And I got in. And then I went. And I loved it. Right? So... When we take a look at uh, writing this book, it was really an unfolding. Um, and at that point, I still hadn't cried. Crying was not my thing. So when I wrote the book, it wasn't therapeutic. People always say, is it therapeutic? I'm like, no, it's not therapeutic at all. Um, and so it was too painful because I now I'm crying every day. I'm, it's 2016. And I, I quit. I stopped writing the book. And a woman named Susan from Denison, she was guiding me through it. She was supporting me emotionally through the process of writing that book. And I quit. And she said, Sean, M and F -er. not to me, finish the M and F -er book. And she had never cursed. She said, you write that thing because people need it. And I'm like, oh, God, okay, I'll write it, I'll write it, I'll write it. All right, I'll do it. And so um, I kept going. And, you know, I'm, re I'm revisiting stuff that I had, had not visited before. I'm revisiting stuff that I had long buried away. Um, you know, I hadn't thought about the swimming pool scene in 30 years. Uh, there was a sexual assault, but it came at the hands of a woman. And it was a very, uh, it was a very confusing period because it just came after a sexual assault by a guy. And one was by force and one was by, um, what would you call it, by... Uh, kindness. So I'm getting assaulted in one and, and enraptured by kindness in another one and my head's going to explode. And on top of it, I wasn't allowed to date. Irma Jean was so Victorian and puritanical in the way that she um, she raised me as far as dating people that I couldn't uh, I couldn't um, couldn't kiss girls, couldn't date girls for sure. Couldn't go out with them. I could be friends with them. But she's always like, you know, if you start dating and one of them gets pregnant, then they're going to get in the way of your goals, so you just don't date at all because that way you can stay focused and you can, you know, you can rise up and get out of this mess. And I'm like, okay, all right. And then I kissed Lisa by the tree in front of my house, and she scared Lisa off, and she told me to get my ass in the house. Get your ass in the house. I said, what? And she said, don't you ever do that again. I said, uh-oh. But she then turned around and said, 
if you ever come home gay, I'm going to kill you. So I couldn't date, and I couldn't be gay. So all of a sudden, you know, there was no room for expression for me. And having been assaulted, when I got assaulted, I put on that mask, the virtual mask, right? Because I had to hide myself from everybody because I couldn't allow the pain in. And when they didn't believe me, when I told them the truth about what had happened, they called me an effing liar. And I said, no, I'm not lying. And they said, yeah, you're lying. I said, oh, my God, no, I'm not. Um, because what had happened when he assaulted me, he put a hickey around my neck that was as red as this shirt, as red as his hat. And it looked like a scarf, right? And so I go walking out of the house, and he's sitting there on the porch with my mom on his lap. He says, Sean, go ahead and home run. I'm like, yeah, I hit this. And so I walk, and I go to Booney's house. And when I'm at Booney's house, there's a girl there. She'd been crushing on me. She wanted me to kiss her all the freaking time and stuff like that. And she jumps up on me and knocks me down because I trip over a crack in the sidewalk. And I'm laying on the grass, and she's wrestling me and stuff like that. And she looks at my neck, and she goes, oh, my God, you're such a liar. And I'm like, what? She said, you said you didn't want to date any girls because you wanted to play second base for the Reds. I said, I do. And she goes, then what's that from? I go, oh, well, mm, there was a girl in school who liked me, and we just kind of got carried away. So I go to school, and I see that girl, and she goes, I thought you just wanted to play second base for the Reds. Now, remember, it's all red, so everyone in the school is looking at me. They're staring. I'm like, mm-hmm. You know, it was embarrassing. It was, uh, I couldn't tell anybody what had happened, which was even worse. And so she goes, what happened? I thought you wanted to play for the Reds. I said, well, there's this girl in my neighborhood, and, you know, we were kind of messing around and stuff, and things got a little carried away. So at that point, I found myself, I had to hide from everything. And I could have either disappeared, because a lot of people would disappear and go into, like, um, PTSD management, or some people will go into uh, um, <laughs> and so what happened was, next thing you know, I'm sitting here and, um, and I'm trying to figure out what's all these messages that are going through my mind and as it goes through my mind um, I'm sitting here saying, oh my god, what just happened? And I disappeared. And the only thing that I had that was, um, the only, I don't know, I don't know. I, I, I wasn't expecting that, and I guess these live streams, things are going to happen. It wasn't me. But in any case, and I, I don't know how to delete it, so. But in any case, I um, disappeared. And when I disappeared, um, when I disappeared, and the other abuses happened, what I used was I used humor on the one side and on the other side I used sports so using humor and using sports were the things that uh, protected me from uh, that protected me from all that kind of pain I, you know I don't know who just call me is um, I can't tell so I guess I'll just have to survive it oh, brother hey just call me would you mind uh, stepping out please uh, I don't think I don't necessarily think that you know our, our people in this room necessarily need this part of the discussion. But in any case, um, the process of disappearing and the process of going through the situation. Uh, <laughs> I'm telling you, ever since I was little, ever since I was little, things like this have happened, and I can't explain it. It's just something um, I've grown used to, but you know, it's a, it's a it's a quirky world out there. But in any case, I never had cried over those situations until I wrote this book. And what I found was is when I raised my hands up to God and I said, you know, you carry me. What He was doing was allowing me to come back into attachment with my emotional self. Because someone asked me earlier, you know, what happened when uh, what happens when all this happens. How can you have relationships? And as it turned out, um, as it turned out, I didn't. I'm going to answer uh, Alba's. Alba, you said, how did you get through all this? Uh, let me explain how I did get through all that. Well, all those messages were retracted. Sorry, everybody. Um, <laughs> I, I, I didn't have anything to do with it. Um, but how did I get through it? And, and that's really a good question because some people say you're so strong. Uh, I've always felt like I was, I was fearful of everything. Um, so I, I always felt a great deal of fear, and 
um, mostly terror because I never knew when was going to be the last day of my life. And as it turned out, I'm still here. So um, one thing that did happen was that from my mother, from Irma Jean, and from my Mama Green, I learned to be really strong in the face of in the face of challenge. And I learned how to just basically stand up. And the way I got through it, it wasn't didn't really have anything to do with me at all. Is I was very funny. Uh, I was very um, athletic, <coughs> and I got along with people exceptionally well. So the big kids in the neighborhood, um, they were very much a protector of me. You know, they would, Mama Green was my buffer, she was my strength. The kids were the ones that elevated me and they surrounded me like a shield. No one messed with me, as, and none of the teachers messed with me because my mother would take care of that. And nobody messed with me in the neighborhood because Irma Jean actually pulled a gun on one of the kids. He kept pushing me down on the ground and I was all cut up. And when I got done being all cut up and my elbows were jacked up and my knees were jacked up and I had blood on my face, she brought him in the house the next day and she goes, um, can you come in here for a second? He was a paper boy at the time and his buddy was with him. They come in the kitchen and she used Mama Green saying and she goes, you see that little boy over there? Yes, ma'am. Um, there's nothing in the drugstore that will kill you faster than me over that little boy. I was like, it could be a bot. I don't know. Um, and so she puts the gun on the table and points at him. And she goes, let me tell you something. If he ever comes home that way again, I'm coming after you. I'm shooting you. And I don't care who did it. I'm going to make sure that you're the first one that feels my, pain, my wrath. And so he said, yes, yes, okay, Miss, Mrs. Bennett, Mrs. Bennett, okay, that's fine. And so um, I was never bothered again by those kids, so um, I, d I didn't have to fight anymore. The fighting disappeared because I used to have to fight all the time. I wasn't very good at it, but I would swing. I would swing. I'd protect myself. And so what happened was is the kids started rattling around me, and they would smoke their dope and pass it on. And here, Sean, you want some? They called me Sean Lewis. My middle name is Lewis. I acted like it was my last name. Here, Sean Lewis, um, you know, uh, try this. I said, no, no, thanks, I'm cool. And they're like, are you judging us? I'm like, no. Are you, are you judging us because we're using drugs? I said, no, are you judging me because I don't? And they're like, no. I said, don't I have as much, uh, don't I have as much, uh... oh, thank you, Danielle. I said, um, don't I have as much right not to use it as you have to use it? Well, yeah. I said, then, are you disrespecting me? And I was eight, and they're 16. Well, no. I said, okay, then. I said, keep doing what you're doing, and I'm going to do what I do. And it wasn't too much longer that one day, Junior, who was our godfather, um, he was the head of our group. Junior, you know, they're doing the same thing one day. And Junior looks over at me, and he goes, Sean? I go, what? He goes, Sean Lewis. You know what, Sean Lewis? I said, what? He goes, someday you're going to be a doctor. I said, a doctor? I said, I don't want to perform surgery. He said, <laughs> he said, you're different. I said, what you mean? He said, no, you got, you got this, you got this uh, thing about you, this energy about you that's different than the rest of us. You're going to, you're going to get out of here, and you're going to be a doctor. And they all said, yeah, man, you're going to be fine. I always thought I was one of the crew, right? And I found out in 2017, I went up there to do a keynote speech. And I was like, yeah, I'm just one of the guys. I'm just one of the guys. And they're like, yeah, you were one of the guys, but we weren't the same as us. You were a lot different. And you had, a, you had a glow and you had a gift. And the gift really was, that's the other part, Bertha Green as my, as my savior, right? She saved me. I wouldn't be here if it wasn't for Bertha Green. I mean, that's just the bottom line. I'd either been dead in, in jail or certainly um, adopted in a totally different family. So it's impossible to know exactly where um, where I would have ended up. So I had her as a buffer. I had the kids in the neighborhood who protected me from other street gangs from other neighborhoods. And then I had a great school. So when when we take a look at education, you know, I you know, my teachers, they always knew that something was up because in second grade, you know, as someone was asking, um, I was blacking out in class. And when I blacked out, I'd go out to the library and start reading. Uh, Curious George of all books. I don't know why Curious George. I didn't even like Curious George, but I would go read Curious George and I'd black out. And they had said that, you know, I was creating this imaginary family. I, I think I told this class. I'm not even sure which class I told them. But they went through all these psychological um, tests 
and they found out that I had created an imaginary family and I had detachment disorder. And so, as it turned out, um, the imaginary family was easy to explain, but they couldn't explain the blackouts. And, of course, my mother was humiliated and I got, I literally got the hell beat out of me and ended up in the hospital and I was removed from the hospital. Now, Mama Green had always told me that my mother had a nervous breakdown, but I wasn't allowed to go see her. And every day when she would drive by the house, Mama Green's house, to go home, I'd wave to her and I'd say, I love you, Mom. And I said, and I'd turn around and I'd say, Mom, you know, why didn't she ever come see me? Doesn't she care? She cares, honey. She had a nervous breakdown. She'll be able to come see you when she's, when she's uh, up to it. And she loves you. Don't worry about it. And I'm like, okay. All right. So months went by. And after the few months had gone by, I finally got to see my mom. And, you know, we tried to repair things. And it was a little bit better. But um, someone in the class asked me, uh, do I still have blackouts? No, I don't have blackouts. Um, but I do have very strong emotional responses that I have to manage because you know PTSD I do have PTSD because the day my mom tried to kill me she attacked me while I was asleep on November 1st 1981 and I woke up to the lamp cracking over my head you can read about it in the, in the chapter called the morning childhood died and so in that particular chapter um, in that particular chapter um, I wake up and I get beaten to a bloody pulp and at the end of the chapter, and I'm not going to go through all the details because it's a little bit too violent. I, there's other videos on it. But, you know, the part that was life-changing was when she threw me out of the hallway into the kitchen. She rips the shirt right off my back with her nails. And there's this channel of nail prints that were ripped down my back. And there's blood everywhere. And so the shirt was completely ripped off. And after... It was about an hour and a half. Finally, you know, she had knocked everything in my room over. My bookcase was thrown over. My armoire was flipped over. My clothes were thrown everywhere. Everything on the dressers all on the ground. And um, so she, there were all these thumbtacks because I used to have a cork board that I used to hang stuff on, Dr. J's stuff and quotes and things like that. And there were all these thumbtacks on the ground. And I saw them and she saw them. And she said, walk on those tacks right now. You're going to know what abuse is. I had given a speech in class on child abuse, and I had practiced it with her, and she had been abused, and she said, now you're going to know what abuse is. She said, walk on those goddamn tacks. And I took a step on the thumbtacks, and one of, them went, one of them went into my right heel, and it didn't go all the way in, but it penetrated, and I looked down, and I said, I can't walk on those tacks. So I spun back to my left like I was playing basketball. I did a pivot left like I was doing a, a, a roll, a pick and roll. And I looked at my mom. I looked her dead in the face. I said, Mom, if you make me walk on those thumbtacks, one of us is going to die today. I don't know who it's going to be, but one of us is going to die. And it ended. And she walked out. She stopped at the kitchen door. She said, clean this mess up. And I said, okay. And I said, just leave. Okay, I'll clean it up. And Irma Jean's coming down the stairs, 350 pounds, clunk, 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 clunk. And I'm like, can't believe she sat up there and listened to this and didn't do anything to intervene. Because right? they took a vote the night before on Halloween. There were eight adults sitting at the dining room table. Should I beat them or should I talk to them? And it was seven to one in the vote. And that's how I got attacked was the next morning uh, because of this vote. So I lay down on the kitchen floor and I'm looking at the ceiling just like this. And I'm like, hmm, what do I do? I don't have any value to the one person that's supposed to love me. So how can I have any value to myself? And I'm like, you know, should I engage in this egoistic, egoistic suicide, which is where you're overly integrated into a belief system, and then when that belief system gets broken, you no longer feel attached to the world? Or do I have any method of strength to overcome this experience? I didn't cry, but I was laying there. And I thought, and I thought, and I said, you got to call Mama Green. That's all you can do. So I call Mama Green. She comes, I said, Ma, she picks up the phone, hey, baby. I said, hey, Ma, I said, you need to come over. She said, what's wrong? I said, I've been beaten horribly, and I said, I need you. I'll be right there. She grabs her gun, and she comes flying over to the house. And um, 
when she comes in the kitchen door, because it was unlocked, because I didn't go lock it. When she comes in through the kitchen door, she sees the mess, dishes everywhere, you know, skillets and pots and pans, chairs flipped over. But, I mean, there was nothing that was standing except the couch. All the tables, the wet bar, everything was flipped. It was, it was, it was a nightmare. It looked like a, literally a tornado had ripped through the house. And so she drops to her knees and she goes, um, Oh, my Lord Jesus, God, why did this happen to my baby? And she's pointing the gun up in the air like this. And she says, I'm going to kill her. And I said, no, you can't kill her. You can't kill my mom. And so um, we cleaned up. When my mom came home, she put the gun up to my mom's head. And she said, I'll tell you what. If you touch him again, I will kill you. Baby, let's go. So we left. And that was the last day I ever had a fear of my mother. I never once had another fear. Um, I knew that she was never going to touch me again. Now, three months later, five months later, my stepfather puts his fist through the front door. Kapoom! My future stepfather. No woman of mine is going to have a college education. My mother only needed two classes at the University of Toledo to finish. No woman of mine's ever going to get her college degree. Here's a fist through the door, and I'm looking, and I see the fist, and he's trying to reach through. I'm like, shit. So I went upstairs, I get her in jail. I said, Gene, you need to come downstairs. Kenny's going to beat my mom to a pulp. She said, what? And she puts on her slippers and she's got her nightgown on. She grabs her gun. We go flying down the back stairs. And just as he's ready to pound her, Emma Jean puts the gun up to him. Don't you touch her. Don't you touch Susie. I wasn't going to touch her. You better back away before I, before I shoot you. He backs away. Long story short, um, he never touched her again. But about two months later, they got in a fight because I wanted to go bowling. And I called her and Jean because my mom was on a date with uh, with Kenny. And she goes, uh, I go, hey, Jean, would you mind taking me to go bowling with John? What's wrong with your mother? Can't she do it? She used a lot worse words than that. I said, uh, never mind, Jean. Uh, I'll just call mom. Uh, don't worry. I'll just call mom. No, F that. I said, no, I just, I don't worry about it. I won't, you know, I'll just. So she comes down the back stairs. I'm talking to my mom. I say, hey, mom, can you take me bowling? They've been drinking. I didn't know how deep they were into it. What's wrong with Irma Jean? You can read for the real words in the book. I don't know what's wrong with Jean. She said that, you know, you're my mother. You should be taking me to go bowling, not her. Ah, oh, that, mm, 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 beep. And it, here she comes flying home. They meet up in the kitchen. I'm in the living room. I'm like, oh, God, I don't have nothing to do with this. And get out of my house. Get out of my house. My mom's yelling. Irma Jean says, you're a this, you're a that, you're another thing, and you're this, and you're a terrible example for your son. I can't believe you throw away all these years of raising him for this. Guy. And there's like explosion. I've never seen anything like it. And I'm, I, it was one of the first, it wasn't the first time, it was one of many times that I could see hatred. And when that hatred nullifies the existence of another human being, when they become erased from what is real, then they can become the target of aggression. Not just aggression, lethal aggression. This is where these homicides come from. and uh, It's because you erase the personhood of someone else. And in doing so, and in doing so, um, uh, sorry, in doing so, lethal lethality becomes a real option. Because the emotions are so, the, the uh, adrenaline and the emotions are roaring so loudly that it becomes uncontrollable. Something that you can't just turn off. And my mother, who was a fighter, even though she was tiny, she was only 4'10", maybe 100 pounds, Irma Jean went walking by, and my mom pushed her in the back. Boom. Get out of my house, you no good. Whew. If you ever saw 350, pound, 350 pounds turn with the speed of light, Irma Jean did it. I never saw anything so fast. She spun around, and she grabbed my mom by the throat with one hand and put her up against the uh, fireplace in the kitchen, the, the backdraft thing took her with one hand and grabbed her with the other hand and she's strangling her in the kitchen by the refrigerator. And I was like, oh, no, Jean, stop. And I come running out of the living room and I'm playing football at the playground. I hit her. Boom. She throws me down to the ground like I don't even exist. I'm like, what? Because the adrenaline, that strength that she had, because she was already a strong woman. My mom's choking and I, I run next door to get Whitey. His name was Wayne Butch Whitey. He had all kinds of names that we called him. 
I said, why do you got to come over? I'm a Gene Strangler and my mother. And he was in boxers and a t-shirt. And he just, he didn't even put on any shoes. He just ran. And his kids, Chris and Brian, come running to the front door. His wife, Sue, is running to the front door. And they're all staring out. And I go running behind. And I, we both go in the house. I'm a Gene. He yells, stop. He goes to grab her. And Irma Jean, he, this guy played for the Tigers, Detroit Tigers. He's six feet tall, five, eleven to six feet tall, two ten. She throws him to the ground with one hand. Still strangling my mom. Now, by now, my mom's eyes are rolling back. She's frothing at the mouth. She's leaving us. And Whitey gets up, and he just tackles her like a linebacker, Irma Jean, and throws her to the ground. Kaboom! My mom is gagging. Irma Jean's on the ground. She gets up, and I don't know why she's yelling at me. I hadn't done anything. She said, your mother was a prostitute, and when you were born, you were born to a, a John, and da 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 so you're not even a bastard, you're a prostitute's bastard. And I'm like, what do I do? Why, why am I getting this? And I thought that for a long time, and I cracked the riddle later, that that was, that was a lie just to hurt me. And so she leaves. My mom comes back to, she's resuscitated, and we leave. And we spent that night homeless trying to figure out what we were going to do, and at 6 o'clock in the morning, uh, I said, you got to move in with Kenny because... If you can't live at home, then you got to move in with him because that's the only option we have. And we went over, walked to his house, 6:30 in the morning, knocked on his door. Kenny, this is March 23rd, uh, 1982. Um, can we stay here? Well, yes. Who was wrong? She, he sees the neck, and but I can't stay here unless we get married. So they got married that Friday, and then things got crazy. It wasn't crazy yet. Then it got crazy. So. You know, when I wrote this book, I had so many emotions that came through me. But the question was, how did I get through it? Well, when all this stuff was going on and those scratches appeared on my back, I had teachers who loved me. They didn't just teach me, they loved me. And I went into Al Getman's office and I said, hey Al, I'm ready to cry. He said, what's wrong, Shani? I said, I can't, I can't change for um, practice. He said, why? I can't go to basketball practice. He said, why, Sean? Or soccer, whatever it was. I said, because I've been attacked. He said, what do you mean? Because I was beating the mouth for an hour. She was punching me in the mouth, trying to knock my teeth out because of the braces. She had spent $3,000 on my braces, and she wanted her money back because no spoiled punk like me should be allowed to have straight teeth. Is what she was arguing. And the argument changed to, you're going to accept Kenny as your stepfather, and um, and I, I had no animosity towards him because he had been my baseball coach. It was all cool with me. And she was beating me over things that other people were saying. So the rumors, see, that's, that's why you don't talk about people, man. Because rumors have the ability to engage an emotional response. And rumors that are not real that engage an emotional response have a lethal quality that when escalated within a particular context can express itself violently. And so... All these rumors being spread. And I'm like, Al, I got beaten really bad. And I showed him my back, and he starts to cry. My teacher's just bawling. He's like, oh my God, what's going on over there? I said, I, I can't tell you, but I said, I just, I just need help. And so my grades went like this, and he held a faculty meeting. And the teachers knew, the students, everyone knew something was up, but they didn't know what it was. So they were like, hmm. And finally, I tell them what's happening. So they held a special faculty meeting. So they said, um, he said, you know, everybody, here's what's going on with Sean's life. We need to save this kid. Because this kid has a light to help other people. And so the teacher said, we'll help him. And they did things. I still had to do this crazy workload. I mean, it was harder than college. Um, but they bent over backwards to make sure I could get through. And I got through, right? So how did I make it? One, Mama Green always taught me and built my self-esteem. She constantly worked on building my esteem. So my esteem was good. My confidence was poor. I never felt smart, physically apt. Um, however, I always had strong esteem that I could stand up to anything, right? But then I had these neighborhood friends who always stood by me. My friends at school were always there. They were so, we were so connected. We were literally a family because there were only 32 or 33 of us in the graduating class. And then the teachers rallied around us. My mother loved me. You can't tell because of the nature of the stories, but she loved me. Irma Jean did. 
Mama Green did, Guy did. And so I had a street gang that loved me, I had friends that loved me, I had school friends that loved me, and I had teachers that loved me. And they had to work. You talk about it takes a community to raise a, raise a child. It took every last person in that network to hold me up because my knees were weak. And when I got out of there, at the end, my mother, two or three weeks before it was time for me to go to college, she asked me if I had enough money to pay my tuition. And I said, well, you always promised if I went to college, you'd pay for it. And this is like three weeks beforehand. And she had just retired and had $27,000 in cash. I said, you just retired. She said, how much is your tuition? I said, $3,000. And she said, my money's gone. I said, you just retired. You got $27,000. She said, no, baby. I spent all that money to pay off Kenny's debts. I said, what? She said, no, Kenny and I believe it's time for you to grow to be a man. And, you know, to be a man, you need to pay your way. I said, ma, it's three weeks before school. And she said, sorry. I said, I'm going to tell you something. I said, I'm going to tell you something. Not you, not Kenny, not nobody is going to stop me from getting that degree. I will get it. If i got to pay my own way, I will, I will pay my own way. If I have to wash cars in the middle of the night, I'll wash cars. But no one's going to ever stop me. And that's where my ferocity came in as far as meeting goals and meeting needs. You can't. You? The only person that can stop me is me. And I have enough things from that era that back me up and break me down that it's really hard for me to keep marching forward. But I have developed a lot of self-management tools to handle and process information. I'm not nearly as angry and violent as I could have been uh, based upon you know my mom. And the, the reason was, or her, my grandmother, is because I learned anger management earlier, you know, how to keep things at peace. I got a little frustrated around 2016. I've been reconstructing an internal self-talk language system and it's paying dividends. I have a bunch of things up here. I can't read them. One of them is, uh, for example, it says hope works. Forgive yourself, find the mistake, determine the change, and commit to a better direction. So when I make a mistake, that's exactly what I read. Then I have another one up here. A setback is a setup for a comeback. Now read these, right? And over here it says, I love you, I like you, and you're worthy of your dreams. And guess what? Guess what? When Mama Green shoots her stepfather on page one, she shot him because he was going to kill her. Right? And when she shoots him three times, and he falls in the driveway, and she escapes because a man drives her away. 32 years later, she's telling a mother, a future mother, who's pregnant with a little boy, who wants to either have an abortion or have an adoption. She tells this woman, don't you do it. I will raise that baby for you. So I'm in this world. This woman shoots her stepfather, tells my mother she's going to raise me. Then she raises me. Then I go off and have 20,000 students who get to hear these stories, get to hear these stories of darkness, again, get to hear these stories of light and hope, right? And it dawns on me a couple years ago when I came up with the idea of Hope Works as my um, company name. It used to be called Greener Day, Mama Green, Green. Her stepfather. Thank you. So when she sues her stepfather, it gives her life. And phenomenologically, all of her experiences led her to tell my mother, I will raise your child. Then those experiences get shared and passed on to me. My experiences get shared and passed on to you. I'm just a teacher. I'm just a guy out here in the stream with you swimming under the same currents, with the same institutional structure and the same cultural alignment that you're experiencing. But what happens is, is because I have hope and I know how to execute a structure based upon that hope, here's what I'm able to do. I'm able to give you sociology and criminology, but I get to give it to you in a real life scenario so that you can apply the concepts to your life and then you can look at your life in the stream and therefore find light and hope in your day so that no matter how bad it gets you know there's a way out and as long as you always know there's a way out you can always rebuild your team with people who will support you you can always work on the self-talk and the way that you see yourself and build your esteem so when your esteem matches the group of people that surround you and you start executing a plan there's nobody in this class who can't find their greatness nobody the question is can you overcome being beaten down by a system that makes you a conformist into a, uh, institutional alignment that you don't control. 
So the question always will be, and it always has been, are you able to be disciplined enough to see that you are great and that you are worthy of your dreams, that you do love yourself and you do like yourself, and that you build a team of people around you so that you all can work together to create a better life for all of you. And in doing so, this is why you only see a small handful of people who ever reach their greatness, because that climb is a perilous climb. It is a daily process. It is not a destination. It is a process of becoming. You never get there, but you can find joy in everyday experience rather than seeking out this broad, general-based happiness. If you can find joy in the little things along the way, it is the journey that is the happiness. Right? So Buddha says, the obstacle is the journey. So all these things that happen along the way, someone asked me, would you change anything? Nothing. I wouldn't change a thing. I wouldn't change the beating. I wouldn't change the sexual assault. I wouldn't change seeing guns being pulled on people, knives being pulled on me, people trying to, you know, sexually aggrieve me. The only thing that I would change, and I don't even know if I'd change that, was the Halloween massacre of 81 when my mom tried to kill me because it was such a damaging experience. PTSD, all these things came from it. But I don't even think I would change that because that was the darkest day of my life, but yet still I was able to rise up from that rubble. And at the end, by the way, just for those of you who always are curious about this, me and my mother became best friends. We took some time. It took some time for us to fix those. And there were other things that happened after that that were very uh, complicated. However, we both loved each other. We always did. We always wanted to be close. And so over time, we both took steps to fix it. And we did become, by the time she died in 2014, we were best friends. And that is the greatest part of the story is that, you know, even the persons who create the greatest darkness in our life, if we know how to if we know how to forgive ourselves and we know how to forgive others, we can always mend fences rather than dealing with hate. We can always find love as a solution. And that's kind of goopy, but it's not just love in terms of, oh, baby, I love you so much. Not that kind of love. It's the kind of love where, you know, we respect one another, we reach out to one another, and we hold each other up because of, because of that respect. And in that regard, then we can always, here we go again, we can always find a better solution. Once this thing is unfrozen, which it will be here in a second, um, I, I see that there aren't any, it looks like the chat room isn't working per se. So let me just say this, is that that was kind of weird that just call me, Charlotte came through here, especially at the moment. I mean, what's the irony of this? I'm talking about sexual assault, and here comes these bizarre um, statements, which I guess was a bot, and thanks, thanks for reporting it. But let me just say, let me just say this, is that the reason I always believe in my students, and I always say on the first day of class, which you didn't get to experience, is I am not your teacher. I'm not a professor. I don't even look at it like that. I am just another student in this class learning from you. And what I try to do is I try to give you a story, something to hold on to that you can apply to your own life. I insert the terms that you need to know, and insert a way of thinking so that you can understand how sociological concepts shape the way in which your life works. But at the end of the day, what I'm most interested in is for you to find your greatness, for you to find your voice. And in this world that is constantly changing where the dynamics of artificial intelligence and the dynamics of, you know, robotics are changing the labor force in which we work, that what happens is, is that you find your own voice. When Len Jordan told me, and I love this quote, I say it all the time, is that your job in life is to sing the song that you were meant to sing and not the song that everyone else tells you to sing. So based upon that, you all have a gift. I don't know what it is, but you do. And if you forgot what your gift is and you forgot what your dream is, it's in here. It's in here. Nobody can tell you what it is. So in my opinion, you have one job in this life, and that is to align your passions with your dream, take your skill set, and put it in the trends. And if you put it in the trends with your skills and your passions, you will find yourself in a greener day. And by letting hope be your foundation, you can always build a process around it and find yourself in a beautiful place. And at the end of the day, the only reason I teach anymore is to help my students find their own path. Not the path that I walked, but the path that you have walked. And understanding that your path is every bit as valuable as anyone else's. Right? Those of you who have been abused, who will have the effort? You will have the opportunity in some day to help somebody who's walked in your exact footsteps 
and they will listen to you for the simple fact that they know it's real and they know that uh, you have walked through it with them. And you know what? Cassandra, yes, thank you. Kristen, thank you. Uh, Mark, thank you. Jocelyn, thank you. All of you who are here this evening, thank you. Um, if we were in a real life class, you'd find out on the first day that I see you as my family. I don't see you as students. And as your brother or your uncle, I don't want to say father, but you know what I'm saying, you know, as your family member, I really feel like um, it is my job to put my arms around you so that you can feel the strength that you can accomplish what it is you need to accomplish. And that's about all. Oh, God, you guys, don't make me cry, man. I've been crying all this. Very thank you. You know, you're welcome, Juliet, um, Daniela. Um, thank you very much. I love you guys. And you make, you make it uh, easier for me to wake up every day and do this. Um, it's been a great experience for me to teach live. And I hope that on this uh, group chat, that when the semester ends, the group chat doesn't end. Because I'd like to maintain contact. You know, like I said the other day, last week, I think. I don't know if it was this class or whatever. I want to see what happens. And along the way, you're going to need somebody. I'd love for you to be able to reach out to me and say, Hey, Sean, Sean Easy, would you mind giving me a hand? Because this hand, this hand belongs to you. All right? My best to you all, Roxanne, Danielle, all of you, Cassandra. Thank you all so much. Um, I felt like we had a great evening. I hope you can. <laughs> I hope you can use this for your uh, for your benefit. Um, and you all be blessed. I will be making announcements on Thursday and Friday, uh, so that you know what's going on. I have a couple nice surprises for you. But next week we're going to be focusing on how to build your financial house, and I'm going to make a series of short videos. Uh, I love that. I'll be making a series of short videos that will teach you how to put your financial house in order. And uh, based upon that, if you need help or whatever, you can turn to me on that one because that is what I do part-time on a professional level. And I want to just tell you all to have a great evening.